Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. Friday night, and you're listening to Paranormal Review Radio, the only radio show without commercials and with more great paranormal talk. I'm Anthony Agani in New York. And I'm Lucy Liebfried in Chicago. Are you ready for another Paranormal Friday night? We're so happy you can join us. We welcome all of our regular listeners and those of you who have tuned in for the very first time. If you have a question or If you have a question about the topic tonight, feel free to ask us in chat or call the show at 661-244-9831. We will try to get to you as soon as we can. And don't forget, you can always send us an email with future topics that you'd like to see on the show or if you just want to say hi. Our email address is paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com. And last but not least, check us out on our Facebook show page, our YouTube channel, for more information on the paranormal and upcoming shows. Now, put your hands behind your back, because you're all going to prison tonight. (laughs) This is coming coming from Ward and Lucy. Um, (laughs) Well, well, I I just want to inform everybody that uh, tonight's show... um, is going to be a little bit different than what we planned. Uh, Originally, we were going to have the guest, Charles Adams III, on tonight to talk about uh, his history, his uh, writings and ghost books that he's written about, mostly on uh, pretty much all of Philadelphia, Rhode Island. He's even done some books in New York. Uh, But unfortunately, he had to cancel last minute. So you guys are just stuck with Lucy and I. But... What we're going to do is we'd like to open up the phone lines to all of you that are listening and in chat right now. Uh, We're opening up the phone lines to you guys. If you'd like to call in and talk about Eastern State Penitentiary, if maybe you have investigated there, if you've been to the place, or you know, even if you've just gone on a tour of Eastern State Penitentiary, if you may have had some stories that you want to share with us and with our listeners, or if there were some weird uh, spiritual, ghostly encounters that you've had at in Eastern State Penitentiary. We'd love to hear from you. So give us a call at 661-244-9831, and uh, we'll put you on the air, and uh, you know you can tell us about your stories or if you've got questions. You know, Lucy and I have been to Eastern State Penitentiary twice before. That's actually the... Uh, uh, the first time we've been there was the first time actually Lucy and I met, and thus has produced the show. So um, tonight what we're going to do is we're still going to talk about Eastern State Penitentiary, obviously. We're going to uh, you know, talk briefly about the history. We're going to talk about some of the things that Lucy and I found that were uh, a little bit different, or I guess not different, but a little bit more in-depth of the, the history within Eastern State Penitentiary that I wasn't aware of. And I'm not sure if you guys were aware of it. So we're going to talk about some of the things that we found. Uh, We're going to talk about uh, the cute dog that was arrested and put Mm -hmm. in prison, Pep the dog. Uh, We're going to probably talk about a little bit about Quakers and how, because it was basically a prison that was Quaker-inspired. And, you know, who are the Quakers? What are they all about? So we're going to bring up all these topics. We'll even go back into our old... Uh, investigations that Lucy and I have done and talk about the stories that we've had uh, or the experiences and the encounters that we've had there. Um, I can even talk to you about my experience uh, the first time that I was at Eastern State Penitentiary. That was actually uh, later on I was uh, filmed for uh, the show on the Sci-Fi Channel, uh, Haunted Encounters Face-to-Face. So um, 
We're going to talk about everything Eastern State Penitentiary. And why are we going to talk about Eastern State Penitentiary, Lucy? Because next Friday night, we're going there. <laughs> it's our next investigation. Um, it's our third time there, and I am looking forward to this so much. I mean, you know, there's certain places that you go and they kind of make an impression on you. And, you know, everyone talks about these these haunted locations and, you know, the activities that there, but every once in a while you'll find some place that you just have a connection with. And I think for us, Eastern State is one of those places. I mean, every time we've gone there, you know, well, every time, both times that we've been there, each time has been actually different. And, you know, it's like you learn something else and every experience just opens up doors to some some other insight or some other way of seeing the place. So I'm pretty sure that this next investigation is definitely going to be different than what we've experienced. And again, too, it's going to be a little bit different because we're bringing uh, people with. And I don't know, um, Anthony, have, have have they been to Eastern State before? Yeah, uh, no. This this will be this will actually be the first time that they've been at a. Uh, well, actually, no. I'm sorry. I was going to say that they've been at a prison. One of the persons that will be with us um, has been to a prison. Um, actually, we were all together at Mansfield mm-hmm. Reformatory. Mm-hmm. Um, but this will be the first time that they're going to be at Eastern State Penitentiary. And you know, when we say we're going there next week, we're actually bringing all of you guys with us. We're going to be broadcasting live from Eastern State Penitentiary. And in addition to the radio show that we're going to do there, we are hoping and praying and crossing our fingers and our legs and our toes and everything uh, we're crossing to hopefully get this on video <laughs> live as well. Um, we're going to be doing some testing of the equipment and of the software this weekend, Lucy and I, which, Lucy, I don't think I even told you, but uh, we're going to be testing that out this weekend. <laughs> so um, I, I want to make sure that it works properly. And then uh, when we get to Eastern State Penitentiary next week, we're going to obviously broadcast live on the air on the radio online. And we're also going to um, hopefully have this broadcasted on Justin.tv which uh, we've created the account and everything, and I've got all the equipment. So hopefully at the same time, this time that you're hearing us, you're going to actually be able to see it as well. And I think what we're going to do is um, focus in on one area for the live investigation because the obviously Eastern State Penitentiary is made up of stone. And so Wi-Fi connections and satellite connections tend to drop when you're in an enclosed space made of stone. So we're going to try and hopefully stick to one area, and I think, Lucy, we're going to stay within cell block 12 because that, to me, is the most active place in the area, the active location. Mm-hmm. It's where we have had a lot of experiences, where I have had a huge experience in that place, uh, in that location in Eastern State Penitentiary. So I I just want to make sure that uh, we're able to capture as much as we can for everybody who's listening who may not have the chance to get there and uh, have it broadcasted live. But also, we're going to have an EVP session, a live EVP session on air, and we're asking everybody who's going to be listening next Friday night to call in and participate in it. We're going to bring you on air, on live on air. You'll be on our cell phone in Eastern State Penitentiary. And we're going to give you the opportunity to actually ask the spirits questions. So it'll be like you're just there. You can watch it. You can have your voice in the place. But you don't even have to leave the comfort of your own home. How great is that <laughs> well, I'm really excited because this will be the first time that we get to um, stream from a location. So, yes, right. you're actually going to get to see me trip over my own feet in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fun. But, it's going to be really exciting. And, um, it, you know, you'll get to meet the, the folks that are going to be coming with us. And, um, you know, we're going to probably try a few new things. There's going to be probably some controversial things 
that we're going to try at Eastern State Penitentiary. And you're going to be able to watch along and be able to listen along and hopefully participate as well. So we're all excited about that. We're going to do some promotions this week on it. We'll give you all the information that you need to. Just check our Facebook page at Paranormal Review Radio. Or if you have trouble with that, you can always email us at paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com. And we'll send you the link. We'll send you the information because we want to make sure that everybody uh, has the opportunity to get there. You know, we talk to so many people and so many people within our Facebook page. I mean, we've got over 10,000 people uh, that are fans of the show on Facebook and in addition to that, all on Twitter. Uh, we've just got so many people that say to us all the time, you know, oh, we wish we can go. We wish we can, you know, have, first of all, wish I have the courage to do this, um, but also, too, where they wish they would have the finances to be able to go in and, and do, do a paranormal investigation at a place. And we feel for you because, you know, we were at that point in our lives. You know, I've always said it, and, and I've always wished that I would would be able to do it. And I had the opportunity, and ever since then, it's almost like getting a tattoo. You just can't have one. you got to keep going and going. <laughs> and I, I, you know, Lucy and I slave at work, and we save up our money to make sure that we're able to fulfill our dreams and fulfill this this quest that we have. And so we get it. We understand it. And so we want to make sure that you guys have that opportunity. If you if you think you'll never be able to actually go and investigate someplace, give you the opportunity where you don't have to spend any money. You don't even have to leave your own home and be able to participate somehow so that you can say to people, hey, you know, last night I, I was actually investigating a haunted location, but I didn't get to leave my house. I didn't have to leave my house. My voice was there. My voice was in that location. And hopefully, you know, some of these people that have called in, we've done this on previous investigations. It's worked out really well that your voice and your energy, your history, your experience – helped actually to to prolong conversations, to actually even stir up communications with the spirits. So we ask for your help. We want that help, and we want you guys to be there and to be able to call in. So I'm excited for it. I hope you guys are, and I hope you guys listen in next week as well. But tonight um, we want to talk about Eastern State Penitentiary and uh, go through some of the stuff that we found, go through some of the experiences that we've had, and, uh, you know, actually even talk to you guys. So I'll say it again. If you guys have any stories that you want to share, if you've been to Eastern State Penitentiary, don't be shy. Give us a call at 661-244-9831. We'll put you on the air, tell us your story, and we can talk about it. Maybe some of the things that you reveal tonight to us may help us next week. Or maybe some of the questions that you have, maybe maybe we can answer them, or maybe we can actually bring up those questions or some of those instances next week when we do the investigation to help you find those answers. So, again, I'm excited, and I hope you guys are as well. Well, you know what? What I like about this is that, you know, everybody sees the television shows and everybody reads about it. Um but is there something in particular that you've always been curious about for the location? And kind of seeing something stream live or even to listen to it kind of gives you an idea. And if you've ever thought about going to Eastern State, maybe by what we experience will be that last push that actually gets you there. Because that's one thing that I did think about while we were doing research. And every time we think, talk about a location – some of these locations, they really do need your support in order to keep, you know, to maintain and to remain open. And these locations, I mean, they're historic. I mean, the history, when you think of the history that, that goes into, that is there. I mean, just the ground, the building, the walls, everything. But a lot of these locations, they do need support. Um, so if you if you're thinking about going, you know, maybe what we what we do and what we present will give you that final push to get you there. Um, you know, Eastern State, uh, there are, it's an old building. I mean, the building is old. They're constantly doing repairs and stuff. So, you know, a lot of times you'll go into, I mean, Death Row is one of the places that I was reading about. You know, the roof is bad. You know, it's leaking. And rather than let something this amazing fall into disrepair 
you know, they need your support. And if it's just by going and investigating. And I do realize that a lot of these places are expensive. It is expensive to get into some of these places. But the experience is so well worth it. I mean, if there's only one or two places that you're ever going to go, honestly, I think Eastern State should be one of them. I mean, just the history involved in the building, the things that have happened there, and the things that are still happening there. I mean, this building hasn't had an inmate in it for quite a while, but yet they're still there. They're still wandering the halls. They're still making their presence known. And What is it? What is it that keeps them there? What is it that keeps them reaching out to people? What are those stories that they're trying to tell? These are the things that we are looking for when we go there. I mean, it's not just the thrill and it's not just hanging out and and going, you know, for a rush. I mean, we're really searching for those answers. So if there are inmates that are still there, the spirits that are still there regardless, what are they trying to tell us? And is there a message that we can get from them? Is there something that we can do to help them? These are all things that go in, go that come across our minds when we go investigate. So if you do, if you thought about it, you know you got to do it. You know you got to go. You really do. All right. So why don't we get into a little bit of the, the history? And I know people tend to sort of zone out when we talk about the history of things. But, you know, that, that's I'm a history buff. I love to learn about things. I love to find out new things. Um, you know, and, and I don't think maybe, we'll, maybe we won't go so much into the history itself, but understanding Eastern State Penitentiary to begin with. I mean, if you talk about Eastern State Penitentiary, I want to give you an, a, sort of a visual mental idea of, you know, where it was at, where, you know, how it became. You know, you're talking 1829 when this prison was built. And the the prison was the first of its kind in the region, in, in the states, actually, to have this penance, this, this idea of reform for prisoners. Normally, when you think of a prison, it's basically a lock them up and you don't care about them. It's neglect, you know. This prison was built in a way that they were, it was designed in a way to intimidate the prisoners. You were put into this prison in, in order to make a change and in doing so, the intimidation that the outside facade creates, because it was a Gothic-style facade, it, it was supposed to intimidate you, make you feel that you were actually going into a dungeon, into hell. But the way that they proposed the actual reform procedures and the, the mandated rules was to be in silence. There was harsh torture, and we can get into a lot of that. And the reform, it was basically Quaker-inspired. And when you talk about uh, Quaker, um, Quaker is a a sort of sect of religion. It's a part of a a religion. They they sort of created themselves, or they they were saved that they're themselves as a denomination of Christianity. Um, But they have a set of rules that they abide by and that they've created, one of which was this reform mentality and the way that you live your life. Um, They basically had a direct relationship with Jesus Christ, as they've said. There was this direct connection. And um, they've been known to to sort of be called uh, the religious society of friends, Uh, that there's this big priesthood amongst everyone. But they had these set of rules that you had to live by, one of which was silence. Others was prohibition. They didn't believe in alcohol. They did not believe in, um, in the way that you, you wore your clothing. There was a certain way of doing that. Uh, it, it almost, as if it was, if you can picture, I guess, an Amish style, that's the, the type of mentality that they had. And during that time, during the late 1700s and early 1800s, the, the Quakers, or actually, yeah, I'd say mid-1700s, let me just say that, mid-1700s, Quaker religion was actually born in England. And when they brought it over to America, they settled in Rhode Island and in Pennsylvania, and many became politicians. And so at the, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, these politicians who had their Quaker religion decided to create this reformed uh, institution called Eastern State Penitentiary, and it was built on farmland. I think it was called uh, Cherry Hill, right, Lucy? Yeah, it was a cherry orchard. 
Right. And, you know, even trying to do that sort of background information, because, you know, Lucy, um, I try to do this as well, and I know you do. I try, we try to go back in and, and get the history of the land before anything was built. I try and get the information of the land itself. And I had a hard time trying to find any information, previous history, of Cherry Hill or the farmland in in uh, Philadelphia. And I don't know if you ever came across anything on that, you know, mm-hmm. to go back but to Native American history. No, there's really not a whole lot. I mean, it's a it was a cherry orchard. Um, the construction began in 1822, um, but it basically was farmland. I mean, it was farmland, and they built it, and it was a hill, and literally the city of Philadelphia kind of like grew around it, but the original location was basically farmland. And as far as the Native American tribes there, and I hate to bring that up, but again, you have to understand that this whole country um the Native Americans were here, so the land is there. And it really does have a lot to do with what happens in a location. I mean, you can build. I mean, we see it nowadays where they they build brand new facilities on land, and yet things still happen. And it has nothing to do with the new building. It's actually the land. But in this case, there's really not a whole lot on the land itself about the tribes that were there. Um, yeah, there was nothing specific, but when we did history, um, because we were just recently in the summertime, we were at Fort Mifflin, and the Native American history within Fort Mifflin in the surrounding area was the Lenape Indians and uh, uh, the Cherokee Indians, and I think there was one other. I'm not sure if it was Iroquois or not, but there is Native American history, obviously. And for me, I'm trying to find something specific to that area. If there was any kind of history, um, you know, if there were any battles between Native Americans or between the British settlers and uh, the Native Americans, because we did find information when we went to Fort Mifflin in regards to the Lenape Indians and the Cherokee Indians, as well as the British soldiers that were there, specifically on the Fort Mifflin land. But I can't find anything out there specifically by Cherry Hill or within the, the farmland that the Eastern State Penitentiary was built on. So I'm curious, you know, if anybody is actually listening, if anybody has any information out there uh, in regards to the land itself and Native American history, please, I, I would love it if you guys could email us at paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com and let us know if you have any of that because I do want to bring that up when we go next week. We always find, and it's always, uh, we always get a connection whenever we do go back that far and we have that Native American history, especially because, Lucy, you're Cherokee. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I want to try and see if we can find anything. I'm going to do more research this week, but, uh, you know, if anybody has information, I would really greatly appreciate it if you could send us an email. Send us a note on Facebook if you want and uh, and let us know if you have anything on that. I, I think that is most important. Uh, it's not just the history of the location like Lucy was just saying. It's before that. It's the land itself. Well, what I, what, the little bit that I find, it's showing that the Lenape were in the area. So, um, right. Uh, you know, but that's really about it. I mean, there's not really a whole lot, and the history seems to be about almost the same as what we found in the Fort Mifflin area. I mean, as you go north, um, it's not that far. I mean, actually, it's right there, so it would be Lenape. I'm sure there's some Cherokee that went north, but that's really about it. So, you know, as I was talking about the Quaker-inspired uh, reformation of prisons and, and prison life, it, it, the main sort of mandate that was created within Eastern State Penitentiary for the first time ever was a, a mandate of silence. Prisoners were not allowed to speak. Even the guards were not allowed to speak. I've read stories in which guards... Um, actually had to walk softly down the halls. I think they had booties over their shoes, so the shoes would mm-hmm. not make any noise. And they put leather straps around the wheels of the carts, either it be food carts or, I don't know, if they were um, towel carts or something, you know, toiletry carts or something like that, that they would wheel down the hall. They would put leather straps around the wheels so the wheels would not even make noise. I mean, complete silence. And if you know, if you've, uh, you know, if you guys are married out there, if if you've ever had the silent treatment from your significant other, it is torture. <laughs> it is torture. 
<laughs> and so I could only imagine, you know, being in this this place, this intimidating place, this Gothic style stonewalled facade where it had many religious connotations in in the stained glass windows that were there, in the eyelets inside the actual cells that were meant as god eyes. They were they were called god eyes, um and it was this little round circle, you know, skylight in your cell. And that's the only light that came through. There were no windows. And the the reason for that was basically it was to give the presence that God was looking down upon you and God was judging you. And it was kind of eerie. If you've ever seen any pictures of Eastern State Penitentiary during the daytime in these cells, the sunlight comes through and it's almost like a ray, like a spiritual ray of light that comes down. It's almost like you are you're in penance. You are you are giving yourself up and you are releasing the sins and that's what it was meant to be and the silence was was only adding to that factor to keep you in silence so that you had the you kept reflecting on what you did silently in your head that you had to go through it you know if you if you ever have something that you you disagree with or that you want to fight about or something you talk about it because that gets your anger out just imagine having those feelings either if you were wrongly incarcerated or if you're just psycho and that you did something wrong, but you, you want to talk about it. You want to get it out. You want to let those frustrations and anger out. You couldn't do it. I mean, prisoners were, were um, they put hoods over the prisoners whenever they, they let them out of their prison cells. They were not allowed to see anything other than the three walls and the bars that they were confined to for two years or 10 years or 15 years, however long it was. I mean, that to me, I don't know if I could ever last that long. And I can now understand why there are so many insanity cases that were rampant at that prison. Well, the other part about it is, I mean, they when you were sentenced to this prison, okay, you literally were giving up any contact because you had no contact with your family. You had no contact with loved ones, nothing like that. You were taken into this prison. Um, From the time that you entered, your name no longer existed. You became a number. And you never saw anyone. They put the hood on just to move you from, uh, from the door to your cell, and that was it. And the silence. I mean, when you know, Anthony, you talked about how the rooms are made with the the skylight. Mm-hmm. It actually is almost. It's beautiful when you see pictures of how the cells used to be when they first opened. It is. I mean, it's actually almost beautiful. But you have to also uh, understand that you have nothing else in your life from this point forward, but those walls. And when you were placed into the cell, the only book, the only reading that you were allowed was a Bible. And that was it. Um, you were expected to remain silent at all times. That was the main focus of this, this prison. I mean, everything was supposed to be in silence. Um, you've lost any ability to complain or to say anything. So sitting in this room, you know, it is the cases where most of the, a lot of the insa- in- inmates went insane. And it's because of the lack of contact. Think about it. You're in a room. You're this is this is your hell for however long you're there. And originally too, I mean, you're talking about you had women placed in there. You had people that were put in there who their crimes were not that serious. I mean, some of the first inmates were in there. You know, they were thieves. They were people that uh, maybe have stolen things, but they were also placed in there with murderers and, and other other really, really bad people. So here you are, you're stuck in this prison, you are expected to remain silent, you know, for the, for the rest of your life there, however long you're going to be there. Insanity really became part of these people, you know, they cracked. Some of the people cracked. Um what was I going to say? My my train of thought, I just lost it. Um, but it's part of maintaining this silence, which led to the the guards, the warden, you know, they were hell-bent on maintaining the silence. Because of that, you were punished. If you made noise, if you got out of line. And some of the things that really 
kind of this time when I'm doing more research, I started learning more about the punishment, the torture that happened to these poor people because simply because they made noise. Some of the punishment and torture that happened to these inmates bordered on just really sheer terror. I mean, it, it seemed like almost, um, oh, God, part of the Inquisition. I mean, here what started out as a an experiment, an experiment in trying to reform a man, actually turned into something that was really horrible and very much a nightmare. Yeah, and to further that, the torture and, and the horrible um, acts of punishment that the prison forced upon its inmates, uh, today we don't even do it to to terrorists. I mean, Mm-mm. the 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 gagging that they provided, there was that um, uh, gag ball that they would strap in your mouth and your hands were tied behind your back and you were left in a location for days. Uh, it, you know, you, you had no water, n- no food. Uh, you could not use the, the bathrooms. Uh, that's torture. That is insane. The other form of torture was during the winter time. if you were caught talking or making any kind of noise, you were taken outside into the the garden area or to the open field area within the confines of the prison and you were chained up to the wall during winter time naked and they would pour water on you and constantly pour water on you until icicles formed over your hair, your nostrils, your chin, your entire body and leave you out there again for days. People died as as at the hands of these guards and and these prison workers because of these tortures and simply because they made a noise. I mean, the agony that I'm feeling as 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 I'm talking about it is so extreme. And so you, you think to yourself the pain and the anguish that these inmates went through. Not that I'm here to say that no one deserved it, but uh the anguish and that energy that is put out that is implanted in the spots where they they died as a result of this is forever lingering in that place to me that energy is staying there and that's the activity that we're seeing there now it's those tortured souls that for some reason or another cannot get away from there cannot leave you know one of the questions that I actually wanted to ask our guest tonight was, you know, for me, if I'm a prisoner and I've died in prison, I, for, for, to me, why the hell would I want to stay in a prison, in the prison that tortured me, killed me? Why would I want to stay there? I'd want to be as far away from there as possible. But I, I can't answer that question because I don't know what goes on in the mind of a spirit after they've gone through something like that. They may be trying to find the truth. They may be trying to find happiness there. Maybe they're confined there. They've confined themselves there because they feel as as much guilt. And so they don't want to leave. And so that is the energy that we're all feeling when we walk into that location. And that's what I want to communicate with when we go there next week. I want to try and, try and see if I can make any sense of it or if I can help anybody, anyone in the spirit world, understand where they're at now if they don't understand it. I, that, to me, it, it's it's that never-ending quest to to jump and, and have that leap into trying to find out. And, you know, we tried to do it the last time that we were there, and we did something different. Do you remember what we did differently last time, Lucy, when we went to Eastern State? We didn't talk as much last time. Right. And I think... That helped us a lot because as investigators, normally when you go into a location, you you know, you're constantly, you're rapid firing these questions. You know, is anybody here? What's your name? You know, is there anybody else here? You know, how did you die? All of those questions. And you're always, you know, having conversations, even amongst investigators themselves when there's the downtime or whatever. But the last time that we went there, we actually, I, I don't know, and I think we talked about it in the last episode from there, that we felt a, a huge heaviness when we walked in there. It was almost, mm-hmm. 
we we felt that right we felt that their their sadness mm-hmm. was alive and i think because of that it's almost as if like when you walk into a funeral you're very quiet and timid um you you don't want to make any sudden moves or any any you don't want to make any sudden noises or even talk. You walk in and you want to give your respect. And the way that you respect something is, you know, usually it's in silence. It's it's usually in a quiet mode. And I think that's what we were sort of portraying subconsciously when we went there last time. Because we were feeling that sadness, we felt as though we were walking into a funeral and that we were trying to just open ourselves up and awaken ourselves and our minds to hopefully receive the communication and we did the last time Mm -hmm. we were there we we got some amazing pieces of evidence but i don't know if you wanted to add anything to that well one of the things uh, that uh, in the research and thinking about the place you got to remember that this is a big stone building and one of the theories that i read about was the fact that because the stone uh, something about the they feel that the stone actually retains that energy because right. of the energy that's still there. The stone resonates, and that's what keeps a lot of the activity within that. Because you've got to understand, here is this big, giant, massive stone building, and it's in the middle of literally a residential neighborhood. You walk outside and there's cars and there's life and there's everything else around it and people are going about their day normally, you know, just walking. And then yet you can just walk into the doorway of Eastern State and the atmosphere completely changes. I mean, it is completely different. You will feel you will feel the heaviness, you'll feel the oppression, you'll feel the sadness. So all of that is still resonating within there. So what we did this last time, we went in and we pretty much just, we didn't speak as much. We barely spoke at all. And it was almost like because, it was like we were listening. We were listening to the building. We were listening to what we were feeling. And because of that, I think we got so much more. It was almost like, it was almost like not paying attention to something and it would try to get your uh, try to get your attention. So, mm. one other theory that I thought about, and I've thought about this again, you know, like like you said, why would somebody want to stay in the place where they've been tortured and where, you know, it has been a horrible experience? Part of me is thinking the people that wanted release. I I have the feeling that they may have left already, and what's left are the really, really hard cases. The people that are just, were so negative and so horrible, maybe they're afraid to move on. Maybe they're afraid of, of you know, being judged, you know, facing God, facing whatever higher power there is that can bring judgment on them. So therefore, I'm not going to move forward. I'll just stay here. Because a lot of the activity that you that you experience and what people have reported, they're reporting things that are very negative, they're very dark, and sometimes intimidating. So these are the ones that have remained behind. Now, whether or not it's residual or whether whether or not it's actually something conscious that will interact with you, I'm still not convinced. I haven't really come across that yet. I know, Anthony, you've had a major experience there, and I kind of wanted to ask you about that. What were you feeling when you saw it? I mean, can you go through that a little bit? Are you talking about when I saw the shadow? Yes. Well, you know, I, I do believe what you were just saying now. I, I do believe that there is residual. I do believe that there is intelligent spirits there, obviously because, you know, a lot of people have seen the television shows of, you know, uh, other shows going there and investigating and getting intelligent responses. Uh, some of the, the the stories of people seeing shadow figures walking in and out of cells and stuff, you know, that, that either could be intelligent or that could be just residual energy that's left there, uh, uh, you know, because of, like what we were just talking about, of of all the, the negativity that went on during there. I mean, you've got prisoners in there. You've got people who are, who killed um, who have uh, are just miserable people who were locked up in there that all of that energy plus the energy of the spirits uh, the, of, of their spirit energy that has moved on or has 
uh, gone to the other side, that is also there. So it's a combination of, of all of it, I think. Um, I also believe that, um, and, and I did mention this, when we went to Pottstown Elementary School in Ohio, when we investigated there, you know, the history of the school itself doesn't have so many negative experiences mm -hmm. or killings or murders or anything like that, suicides. Um, there's a there's a couple of stories, but they've happened off of the location. And one of the things that we sort of talked about during that time was the idea that the school could be a mecca for the spirits because they don't feel as though that there's any other location to go to. And um, we did find history on the land itself that it was... Um, uh, a, a, a but prior to the school being there, that, that there was, um, and I forgot what they called it, but where basically uh, children were sort of dropped off, basically either newborns. Oh, oh God, what's it called? It's um, I forgot the name of it. You think of it while I talk, and then okay. um, when you know when these these babies and these young young children and toddlers were left behind, they were left into this institution where people would sort of, I mean, I, I say it loosely, but taken care of, um, some of which these babies were murdered by the hands of the, the owners of these institutions. And um, we found that that was actually on somewhere within the vicinity, not too far of where the school is. And so we thought that the school itself was a mecca for these spirits to go to because it's an abandoned place, that there's nobody really there. And, you know, as funny as it may sound, they sort of wanted us to move in and have a place that they could freely walk around where they don't have any interactions with human beings, that they could live, quote-unquote, live in peace. And so, you know, the prison here itself could be that as well. I mean, it is a massive, massive institution, Eastern State Penitentiary. It is so big. And as you were saying before, the stone walls um, sort of attract and keep that residual, that energy, that, that spirit phenomenon inside. And so it could be also a mecca for spirits because Philadelphia, the land itself, Pennsylvania alone, but Philadelphia has so much haunted history on the streets. Um, in the in these the surrounding towns, there is so much activity that has gone in there. There's so much regular history, regular normal history of wars and of battles that have gone on there and of the uh, uh, Native American history that has gone there. And so, I mean, you just pile on all of these things, and Philadelphia itself is just a breeding ground for for haunted experiences. And so who's to say that maybe that this institution is not a mecca for spirits that, you know, have sort of traveled to there because they, they who knows, they could see or they could feel or they could hear the energy that's already there, and they, they're just attracted to it. So, you know, I believe that, it, it, you know, a lot of these locations are not just uh, holding spirits of the activity and the energy that was there purposely to be put into that place. I could, I, you know, I think that anything can be possible, and so it could be a mecca for a lot of, uh, you know, other spirits in the surrounding areas. Did you did you remember what the name of that thing was, Lucy? They're called baby farms. Baby farms. That's it. Baby farms. Um, so anyway. Um, you wanted me to talk about my experience there? Yes, yes, because I want one of the things that that like uh, that I think about it's like okay, it's a prison, it's negative. It's really there's very few warm and fuzzy ex experiences that I've had there. I mean, most of it has been kind of oppressive. I've felt fear, I've felt sadness, I have felt um I felt apprehension, but I have not really felt any kind of joy. And that's really different from other locations because there are some locations that we've been to that I have picked up on joy and I have picked up on happiness. But in in Eastern State, as much as I love the place, I've never really felt anything pleasant, you know, like a good feeling. So what I was curious about was actually the feelings that you really got when you saw the shadow figure. I mean, did you get a sense of 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 
intimidation? Did you? I mean, what exactly were you feeling when you saw this? Well, I don't think you're going to find good feelings in a prison. No, uh, you know? not at all. But I, I, I mean, I, you could a little bit, but I, I don't think you you will. You, you know, you're going to have this overwhelming sensation of goodness come over. But uh, my experience that I had the first time that I ever went to Eastern State Penitentiary was during a uh, like a paracon. It was a convention that was held there, and it was hosted by um, the Ghost Adventures crew. Uh, it was with Zach, Nick, and Aaron. And um, funny enough, we did go on a you know an excursion out there. There was you know like I don't know 150 how many people were there Lucy 200 Oh god it was at least about uh at least about 150 Yeah I mean there was just so many people there um and so we went on a 4 hour uh you know investigation with everyone and and they would host it and take groups around 50 at a time or 25 at a time uh, Mark and Debbie Constantino was there uh, they were really awesome during that time. and um, But before we went on, on the actual investigation, they did a uh, an auction, and it was to raise money for one of Zach's, um, I, think it, I think it was a an animal shelter, because uh, he's, a, he's a, a, a big, um, he's pro animals, he's a big animal buff. So um, in doing so, there was an auction, and what they did was they auctioned off a private investigation to go with just you know Zach, Nick, and Aaron and investigate uh, the the, uh, the prison after everyone had done their investigation, and it would start. I think it started at 2 a.m. I think like the whole investigation for everybody ended at 1 or 1:30 in the morning, and uh, if you won the auction, you got to go at, at 2 a.m. with them for, uh, I think it was like an hour and a half. I think it was a 90-minute investigation solely with them, and so, you know, at that time, I, I was gung-ho about it, and I, I bid, and, and I gave a lot of money, a lot of money, <laughs> but it went to a good cause, which I was happy for. As long as it wasn't going into anybody's pockets, I, I would I I was happy to do it, and um, so I won the auction, and I was able to actually go on a private investigation with Zach, Nick, and Aaron to cell block twelve, and uh, uh, there were because there were a few people that were bidding at the auction and they wanted to raise as much money as they could for this charity, they took two other people. Um, two, there were two other people that they took with us, um, to, you know, obviously to take their money so they can go to charity. But um, So I was there with Zach, Nick, and Aaron and two other folks. And it was a really cool investigation. Uh, Zach had put us into separate cells and did an EVP session with us. And, um, and then at one point, Nick had... Uh, uh, Nick had taken one of the other persons uh, to another area in the in the prison. Uh, Aaron took uh, the other person to another area, and I was with Zach. And I was I stayed with Zach in cell block twelve. And during that time, we were both of us were basically walking up and down the what they call the catwalk. You're walking past all of the cell blocks, and I don't know how long. The, the cell block is, I maybe it's, I don't know, maybe 50, or 500, no, not 500. Um, well, maybe, maybe it's about 200 feet, maybe mm-hmm. 250. Mm-hmm. Um, I should find out what that actually is, just so I know that, that information. But anyway, we were walking up and down, and, you know, he was calling out, and I was calling out. And at one point, we were mid midway in this catwalk, and uh, he and I were looking around. I had my IR camera. He had his. I had my digital recorder. And um, at one point, we we were, we were what we were trying to do was basically look on opposite ends of each other, so that if we caught anything, we could say to each other, "Hey, turn around, look here," or whatever. So, at one point, though, it was so funny and it was so mysterious that both of us looked in the same direction, and it was outwards towards there's a if you're ever in cell block 12 down uh, on one end of the hall is a sort of little gathering area i guess that's where the guards would would stay and hang out and uh there's no windows or anything there but on the opposite end there is this sort of cathedral like window there's three panes i remember and it's sort of cathedral you know it's sort of arched at the top and it comes to a point and at one point we both were looking in the direction of these windows 
and we didn't say anything to each other. All of a sudden, on the right side of the windows, I noticed, and he obviously afterwards I know, he noticed it as well at the same time. We saw a shadow figure, and we saw the the head, the neck, and the top of the shoulders so defined. I mean, it was fuzzy, completely black. But the only reason why we saw it is because it passed in front of the window. Now, you're in cell block 12. You are, I believe it is, three or four flights up. So you're not on ground level. There's no way that anybody, if they were walking outside, there was no way that a shadow could be cast inside the place. The light that was coming through those windows was a combination of some of the, um, uh, some of the far end street lights that are outside of the, of the prison walls and the moonlight. And so that's pretty much the only light that, that came through. And so when this shadow figure passed from the right side of the window and moved slowly towards the left side, you, com- you saw it plain as day, the head, the neck, and the shoulders. And at the same time, uh, Zach and I said, did you just see that? Did you just see that? And, you know, in, in the, the Zach mannerisms, he just starts to <laughs> scream and yell. And uh, he uh, wanted, you know, he, he wanted to see it again. And so he kept saying, show yourself, show yourself again. Come here, come here. And um, it was almost comical at the time. But um, unfortunately, though, because we kept looking, as I was saying before, uh, on opposite ends, so when he would turn his head, I would turn my head the opposite way and look on the other end of the hall. I wasn't focusing my camera at all. It was in my hand. And um, I did not capture this on camera at all. But I'm so glad that he saw it as well because it validated my experience. And I knew I wasn't crazy and I wasn't seeing things. And it wasn't just a, you know, some people say you you got those little uh, black marks that sort of wisp across your eye a lot. You know, it's that Mm -hmm. dust that's on your eyeball. Um, You know, at first I thought it was that. But um, when he confirmed it as well, I knew that it wasn't anything like that, that there was a spirit at the end of it. And, you know, when I can tell you the instant in the moment that I saw that image, I, I almost, not froze in fear, but I froze. It almost captivated me because it's almost as if, my mind is saying, you're not seeing that. That's not what you're seeing. But you're seeing it. You are actually seeing this dark shadow figure wistfully, you know, I wouldn't say walk, because the windows are about eight feet above. They, they start eight feet above the ground level there. And so obviously this thing wasn't walking. It was floating across. And and when I, I saw it, I froze. Nothing, there was, I, I remember it. There was no... Uh, emotion. There was no thought. There was no nothing. And it, it was as if it was a slow motion movie being played out in front of me. And the first instinct was, did you see that? And I think that was the same way with Zach. And it was the instant that he said it, I said it at the same time. And I, I, I till this day, and that was the first time I had ever seen or captured with my own eyes a shadow figure. And um, it was so profound and it was so, uh, I would even say uplifting because, again, it, it, valid, it validated everything that I have been trying to seek out after and to mm-hmm. try and find. And I actually was able to finally see it for myself and actually have that experience. And it burned in my mind, in my eyes that experience and that vision and I'm grateful for actually being able to do that so that's why to this day I don't care how much money I spent on that auction it was well worth it uh, mm-hmm. to be to be able to actually have that nothing else happened during during that investigation and I didn't really care at that point um, mm-hmm. and and so uh, I, I I I tried to return there the last time that we went to try and see you know me I have this connection with cell block 12 now Mm-hmm. that uh, I, I just want to try and get back there. There's other things that have happened when we went there the, the second time. And um, I can just briefly say this. The second time that I was there, I, if you remember this, Lucy, I kept walking up and down, again, this catwalk. And yes. I just kept going all around, all around. And I remember distinctly 
getting a, an, just a rush of anger come over me. Mm-hmm. I was so mad and I was so angry, but I was internally, I was trying to control that anger. And so I wasn't saying a word. Um, but I can tell my face got so rigid and I just kept walking around, walking around, walking around. It was almost as if it was like almost a possession. Something came over me. And I don't know, maybe it was the anger of the previous inmates that were there that was being embedded in me uh, or, or they were trying to make me feel what they felt when they were there. But it was, it was, that was the weirdest experience, and that's when I felt emotion, and that's when I felt thoughts of anger, of wanting to hit. I wanted to hit somebody so badly at that point. Um, I'm surprised you didn't run away, Lucy. No, I was sitting there because I could see, I mean, you could literally see the change come over you. Um, your mannerisms changed. Your, your, your walk changed. You, you were not you. And I was sitting at the end next to the shower, and I was just watching. There, I was not going to say a word to you. I was just watching, trying to see what it was. And you could see, literally, you could see the anger go- come over you. It was not you. And I remember trying to talk to you at some point, and you just kept you kept saying, you mentioned, you know, well, I, I feel angry. You said right. it, but it was obvious that, it was not you. It definitely was not you. So um, cell block 12 is definitely something, there is definitely negative and dark there. Um, it is a place where I believe we, it, they kept some of the, the harder cases there, but it is definitely something. And this leads up to another thing, like when you're investigating, and that's one of the things why I'm always glad that you're with me. You know, if you open yourself up a little bit too much, you allow things within your sphere, within your space, within your own energy. And sometimes you have to kind of be careful because you can be pulled along with it. You want to be able to retain your sense of yourself. I mean, it's one thing to open up and to let these things through. But this was, I'm going to say, you were possessed. I, I don't I don't know about possessed, but I think I know the reason why it happened. And I said it earlier that you know we took the approach of of trying to be open and awake to the spirits, and mm-hmm. we were we were we were silent. We were silent in there. Um, we were very quiet. We we didn't say. You know, Lucy. Now that I'm thinking about it. The history of the prison was that they were was supposed silent. to be kept silent. You was know, I silent. just that never hit me before until just now. We were doing exactly what was required of an inmate in that prison. You were not allowed to talk. You were not allowed to interact. That's what we did. And you know, I don't remember. Um, You know, it is plain as day that information in history for it. But for some reason, I don't remember ever marking that on on any of the papers that I had that it was silent. That you know the prisoners were supposed to be silent during that time, or maybe I you know maybe I did read it, but I never really paid attention to it because I was looking for at the the last time we were there, we we were looking mostly for some of the death records or some of the inmate records to try and find names so that we can. Mm you know, sort of have that relationship with and call out during that time. But I never paid too much attention to the silence. And that's funny that, that maybe, maybe that be the reason why we we did have that approach subconsciously, that we just were quiet, we were open, we were just waiting for the for them to speak to us. And so I think maybe because when you're silent, when you are reflecting, when you are trying to be sort of open to the to that communication without any interference from you communicating, you do leave yourself a little bit more open to the spirits and to for them to be able to do more than just communicate with you. And that may have been the reason why I started to feel those emotions and get that anger 
because I, you know I opened up the door the door and opened up that window for someone to convey what they they're feeling now or what they felt before. So that could be the very, very reason why that I was That's feeling that way. That's interesting because all you know the silence it's all mentioned in the history, but you're right we never really pick that point to to use or to try. I mean we've always we the first time you know we went in there we were. Everybody goes in there and they try to communicate and they ask the questions and stuff. But this was this was different. This was going in there with the silence. And of course, the whole basis of that prison, the beginning, is the silence. So I think mm-hmm. we actually became our own trigger objects. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> you know, and and to say, you know, the first time that we went, of course, yes, that was on. Um, it was a group tour, so you've got a lot of people. Um, Personally, I've always thought that when you have too many people in a location, it might intimidate or it just might, you know, the spirits that are there, they just don't want to bother with you because there's just too many people. Even though the first time that we went, you know, we did experience some some really interesting things. I mean, um, I got touched the very first time that I went there, and that was down in the hole. It was uh, Quandike, but it's called the hole, and I remember being in the basement and standing, everybody's standing around and everybody's doing uh, EVP sessions and that. And I'm standing in the dark here. I'm holding on to a pipe to steady myself. And I feel a finger go down my arm, just very lightly, you know, just kind of touched. And to me, that was the most amazing thing because that was my very first investigation. I got touched and it was it was it was weird it was just like somebody just touched you i mean i don't remember any feelings of any dread or any any anything like that but i remember asking you know hey you know who touched me and and everybody's like you're standing by yourself which mm-hmm. was really interesting so i know i was very lucky on that first investigation to ever be touched um i know <clears throat> in other prisons you know, in in Mansfield Reformatory, it's almost like there's a different kind of energy. When you go into Mansfield, to me, though, it seems like Mansfield is a little bit more antagonistic. It's a little bit darker. To me, when I go to Eastern State, I can feel the negative and I can feel the darkness, but it's not it's not as scary to me as Mansfield was. For some reason... Eastern State feels a little bit, I don't know, comfortable, more um, familiar. I, it's hard to explain. Were you in prison before? Is that why it's familiar? Who knows? <laughs> Maybe, Maybe in a previous life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what, one of the things that I found in, in doing – you know, the most recent research for Eastern State Penitentiary was in regards to the female prisoners that were there. And, you know, when you think of prisons, a lot of people don't really tend to think that women were arrested, women were put Mm -hmm. in prison. But um, the interesting facts that I found with Eastern State Penitentiary, you know, and and this isn't common with a lot of prisons even during that time, that if you were a woman and you were arrested, and and I can give you, um, actually, I can give you history of four women that were arrested and put in Eastern State Penitentiary pretty much almost, I think it was like two years after uh, the actual prison opened. So in 1831, there's four women, Amy Rogers, Henrietta Johnson, Ann Hinson, and Eliza Anderson. Those are four women that were arrested. And, you know, their rap sheet is, where is it? Uh, Amy Rogers and Henrietta Johnson were admitted for three years. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Amy was uh, admitted for three years, and Henrietta was admitted for six years, uh, both both for committing manslaughter. Ann Hinson and Eliza Anderson were sentenced uh, for two years each for manslaughter as well. So this isn't just, you know, theft or anything. These these were hardened criminals, and they're female. Now, you'd think that they would be put in prison, they'd put into solitary confinement, 
just like any other prisoner that was there, and treated the same way. And the idea was that you know prisoners were supposed to go through this this protocol, this procedure to be able to be reformed, to become a better person once their time was was up. So that if you came back out into society, you were better, you were rehabilitated, you wouldn't commit these crimes anymore. But when the women were put into Eastern State Penitentiary, uh, it, it was almost as if, and you can probably call it neglect. And now when I say neglect, it doesn't mean that they were just left in a room and they weren't cared for or, or nobody bothered with them. No, it was actually the opposite. But the neglect was that they weren't able to participate in any of this rehabilitation. Nobody cared if a woman was rehabilitated. So if, you know, Anne, if Ann Rogers and Henrietta Johnson or Ann Hinson and Eliza Anderson uh, were in there for manslaughter, they really didn't care if they came out and uh, uh, would commit the crimes again. What they were what they were put through when they went into the prison was they were actually almost, and you can say this, that they were uh, uh, created as slaves to the guards. They were. They, it was almost as if they were like, uh, you know, olden days wife duties, where all they were able to do and what they were supposed to do was cook and clean. And that's what they did in this prison. They were allowed to walk around freely. And in some instances, they were actually given gifts. They were uh, allowed to drink alcohol. Uh, they were allowed to participate in parties that the guards and, and the owners of the prisoners had. So they were, they were given special privileges. It was almost as if they were the wife or the wives of the prison themselves. They were put in solitary, but not for for uh, any length of time. It was basically where they would go to sleep. And then, you know, in the morning they'd wake up and they'd be let out and they'd have duties to do, washing and cleaning and cooking and everything. And so some some even, um, uh, it was almost as if they were like a, even a personal assistant to the wardens there. They They had this freedom, but what was, I don't know, what was disturbing to me was that they weren't, considered that that they could be rehabilitated and i understand that during the time the the you know the late 1700s and the early 1800s women were not equal and um i it's funny though that even though they've committed such heinous crimes that they were not treated the same way as prisoners that they were just expected to to be the wife of the prison to be the slave of the prison and do the wifely duties, if you if, you know, if you will, to to take care of of everybody that was there, and and but then also get special privileges, and so that was interesting to me. That kind that type of of uh, uh, history is really interesting, and actually one of the uh, there's another woman that was there later on. Um, uh, I think it was in in the uh, 1840s. Uh, Julia Moore, and she actually died in the prison. But before she died in the prison, she stated, I want no better home upon earth than I have here, though the prison walls are around me and the doors fastened upon me. So she actually felt as though that the prison was her home, that it was her house. She she didn't want to leave. And she stated this before her death. And, you know, it kind of leads me to believe that Maybe that's the reason why some of these spirits are there, or maybe just why Julia Moore may, may still be roaming those halls, because she felt as though that this was her home. She felt comfortable. As odd as that sounds, she felt comfortable. So um, this piece of history was interesting to me, and I think I want to take this and utilize this when we investigate next week and see if there is any type of communication that comes back from this. Well, you got to understand, too, back in that time and that age, if a, wo a woman didn't have very much right, she didn't have a very good... Life was hard for women back then, okay? So um, on the outside, you know, she's probably scraping hand-to-mouth, whatever. Um, life is difficult. I mean, you're you're basically at the mercy of your husband or, or your male partner, you know, um, Women probably were beaten regularly by by their other half, you know, because 
women really didn't matter. We, they didn't have a, a stature. They didn't have a standing. So here you go, you know, this woman, whatever she's done on the outside, now she's being placed in prison. Well, she's, she doesn't have to scrape hand and mouth to get her meals. She has basically, you know, whether it be misguided, you know, she's got these guards that are allowing her to do something. She has some kind of stature probably for the first time in her life. So when she goes into prison in this situation, it may have been actually much better than what she had on the outside. So, yeah, it is very possible that for the first time in her life, this woman, Julia, she may have found a place where she was comfortable, where, you know, to a normal person with a normal life, you know, whatever that may be, you're thinking, oh, wow, you know, she's in prison, this is horrible. But to this person who on the outside, we don't know how bad her life was on the outside. And then all of a sudden she's placed in this situation. It might have been way better than what she had on the outside. I mean, that's something that happens now. You you look at some of these inmates and they, you know, they have to, they have to find a job. They have to live. They have to find some way to make it in the world on the outside. Well, you know, you go to prison, you've got meals. You've got a place to sleep. You know, you probably have companionship if you don't, you know, if you want it, and even if you don't want it, but it's a lot better than what they have on the outside. So could this be the reason why some of these spirits, they remain there? Because what they found in prison was actually better than what they had on the outside. True. I, I You know, I, I think that could be one of the reasons why they've stayed. It's just disheartening to to know that they... Uh, you know, maybe I'm naive to it, but it's just disheartening to know that, that, you know, even in prison, they didn't care enough to help to rehabilitate, you know. And, and I read stories that that there were um, women that, you know, knew this, that women that were outside of prison, um, you know, never committed crimes or anything like that. They knew that this was going on in the prison with the female prisoners. And what they would do was actually visit the prison to visit these female prisoners and talk to them and try and actually help rehabilitate them themselves and to, you know, give them the education or give them the insight on on, uh, teaching them how they can help to reform themselves, how to, uh, you you know, act better, be better. Uh, do good, all of that stuff uh, that the male prisoners were getting, but here you've got people from the outside coming in to try and help them. Um, It's just, I don't know, it just seemed disheartening that, you know, nobody really, you know, I'll say nobody gave a shit. Nobody cared that uh, whether these women lived, died, were better or or worse, it it was, uh, is that where we get the, you know, the marriage vows, for better or worse? Um, (laughs) But nobody nobody cared, and, and that's, to me, that's disheartening, and it, it just goes to show you the mentality that was going on at that time. And here it is in in black and white, where you've got these women prisoners who are still, uh, you know, were not given the opportunity to better themselves, even in the confines of a place where they were mandating this amongst everybody. Well, I think it's just a general statement on how women were treated back then, um, mm-hmm. you know, whether they were in prison or not. I mean, a woman, women were not given the same rights. They weren't looked at in the same light as men were. And I, you know what? I, if I remember correctly from the other investigation that we did at that time, there's a story about a woman. One of those women actually gave birth while she was in the, in, in the prison and that the, the baby died. Now, of oh, course, really? being a mother, yeah, um, this probably would be a big reason why someone would remain. I mean, if you've lost a child, she, you know, she may still be searching for her child. I know there is one. I can't remember which cell block it is, but there's definitely a cell block that I kept feeling the pull of a female energy, and I know that they're in there. I know that there's a particular female in there. I have not been able to identify who she is or make that contact, but I know there is, it's one of the the cell blocks when you first come in, and I could feel the female energy that's in there. Now, I know I tried to make contact with her, but it's almost like, it's almost like when you go in there, a lot of times what you're feeling is very elusive. It's almost like, they come out, it felt like they would come out 
and they would check us out, and then they would go back in. When we were in certain cell blocks, it's almost like you can feel, you can sense that there's someone. They may come out and they can, they might peek out from one of the cell blocks, and then they'll go away when you look at it. Um, we actually, do. did you see it or did I just see it? There was that light anomaly that came from one cell block, and it almost like went into another one. It was it was like a green glowing light. It was yeah, it looked sure. like it looked like um you know a glow stick, but it was low to the ground. And of course, when you're in there, there are no lights on. It there's nothing that could because at first we even checked to see if maybe it was like some kind of alarm, maybe it was some kind of uh, sensor, anything. There's nothing. There's nothing in these two cell blocks that would give off that would emit any kind of light. And what I saw, I literally saw this small green light, and it came out of one cell block, and it was low to the ground. It wasn't high up or anything. It was almost just like at the bottom. It went across like where the baseboard would be. And it came from one cell block, came out, and it went into the other. And we definitely, we went into the cell block right afterwards. We went into both of them to see if there was anything that would emit this light. And there was nothing. There was nothing. But I know what I saw. And again, of course, whenever you see these things, you never have the camera going. And it just so happens you don't, you know, you know I, I don't have any photographic proof. I don't have anything. But I know what I saw. Well, one of the, uh, one of the <clears throat> interesting stories that, uh, you know, comes from Eastern State Penitentiary is Pep the Dog. Do you... Mm-hmm. Uh, did you find any information that you can share? I mean, I, I have information, but I didn't know if uh, you wanted to talk about Pep the Dog. Well, Pep the Dog actually, uh, it said that he killed the warden's wife. She had a, her, she had a cat, and Pep killed her cat. So Pep was sentenced and was actually given a number and placed in prison placed in the prison. Now, some stories say that, you know, they they uh, adopted him as a mascot. Others say that he literally was a prison. But this poor dog was actually sentenced to prison. So um, some stories say that he was a companion of the guards, that he would, you know, patrol with everybody. But some people do report that they hear the padding on the ground of like a dog walking. Some people you know report that they'll uh, they'll feel like maybe uh you know when a dog wags his tail they may feel the 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 tail brushing against him but people believe that pep is still there that he still wanders which opens up another door you know animal spirits do they do all animal spirits go to heaven i mean do they do they remain why is it that this poor dog is still wandering these halls. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't heard any stories of Pep the dog. Um, uh, you know, I, I know I've heard stories of cats or the or, or the feeling or the knowing of, of what a cat, I guess, feels like in spirit form. Um, but I know when the when Eastern State Penitentiary was abandoned, uh, basically when it shut down in 1971, it was pretty much abandoned for a good 15 years. And during that time, you know, the uh, nature, you know, encroached on this this institution. I mean, there was a forest that was actually growing in one of the cell blocks because it, nature, you know, after being abandoned, nature just grew all along and around and inside this place because nobody was taking care of it. And in doing so, the you know, obviously there are spaces in which animals can get in. And for a good amount of time, I know the history that the, the people from this place, I remember them talking about this, that the place was just full of cats, littered with cats all over the place. And so, you know, during the course of those 15 years, I'm sure animals of all sorts and all nature you know lived in this in this in this prison and died and so you know if people are talking about 
you know, spirit, the cat spirits that they feel or sense, I, you know, it is believable because I'm sure that, you know, things of that nature were in this place and died, and so their spirits may be lingering around. Now, if if you can determine whether or not it's a dog or if you, you can tell whether or not it's a cat spirit, I'm not sure, but uh, I've never experienced anything like that. But, uh, I, you know, it, to me it's a funny story, Pep the Dog. You know, well, I, I understand. Go ahead. Well, the other part about it is, is that um, the governor, it's uh, Governor Pinochet is his name. And, you know, the story about him attacking the cat, uh, there's one article, and I got it from the Daily Mail, that said that the uh, the act, that Pep's actual crime was chewing on the cushions in, in the house, and so they donated him to the prison. And they thought that he could be a re- rehabilitation dog, um, right. you know, to help some of the prisoners. So on that end, you know, Pep, obviously, if he's a rehabilitation dog, he probably felt a lot of love. You know, it's probably the only contact that maybe some of these prisoners had. So, of course, maybe Pep is going to stay around because this was a good place for him. He was in prison for 10 years. He had mm-hmm. he had a hard he had a hard long sentence. <laughs> he had no parole. <laughs> um, but you and know no what? Parole. On cats, um, did we not get? Uh, if I recall correctly, we got uh, a cat meow in our EVPs at Post Town. Uh, yeah, at Post Town we did get that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I remember that specifically. But uh, so, I, I don't I don't remember um, hearing any stories of of dog or cat or animal spirits in Eastern State Penitentiary. You know, I mean, it's, maybe it's something that we can call out to when we're there next week, but, um, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure, I don't see any reports of whether or not Pep the dog died in the prison. Uh, but, you know, that that doesn't have any meaning anyway. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's interesting. It's it's a funny story to to have within prison. You don't necessarily think that a dog can go to prison, but in this case, it was whether or not he actually killed the cat, and 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 uh, you know, the warden sentenced him to to prison, or if it was just that uh, you know he was used as a mascot or a rehabilitation dog to help the prisoners. I'm not sure. Um, and, and Eastern State Penitentiary doesn't even know. They don't have the full story. They don't have any records. Funny enough, his prison number, C2559, is uh, that number was skipped in the records. So there's C2558 and there's C2560. There is no 2559, C2559 on the records. And that's why they're saying that the, the pep the dog possibly you know had that number they gave him that number whether or not it was a true form of a prisoner number or they just gave him that number just to be funny enough to say that now he's within prison and and he is just like you guys and he has a number just as well and he's going to help you just as you're going to help him and everyone else around you so I, I think it's just a funny story it's a cute story to have uh, but Eastern State Penitentiary doesn't even have the true history of it mm-hmm Mhm. Well, one thing I want to talk about is death row. Um mm-hmm. death row actually wasn't death row. I mean, um there were actually no executions performed in Eastern State, but death row is where they did keep the extremely, you know, the guys that were sentenced to death, they were taken out of Eastern State to another prison where the actual execution was was performed. But death row um really is the one place where I did feel, I did feel a lot, and we did get a lot through the uh, ovulus and through the spirit box. Um, a lot of people seem to report. I mean, there were stories about. I believe um, there was a TLC program that was filmed there, and there are two levels to this, but they don't let you go to the second level because the building is in such a state that it's not safe for people to go up there. But at the time that TLC had filmed there, um, they actually did allow people up there and they were filming. And one of the producers, I believe it was, said that when he went to the top of the stairs, felt somebody push him. So our experience in death row, you know, we got some really good interaction with what I will still say to this day were two separate entities. 
Um, one of them appeared to be younger. Um, he definitely was frightened, but there was also an older, uh, I was sensing an older male that was extremely, extremely nasty. And um, he let me know in no uncertain terms, called me a couple names, you know. Mm-hmm. The interaction with him, you know, I mean, he called me a bitch, you know, I swore back at him. You know, we, we developed a really nice relationship. But <laughs> this location, this this spot in the prison definitely has a darker energy, maybe because of the type of people that were housed there. And for some reason, and this I found this out in this research, um, the voice, the younger voice that we were getting, he kept asking for help. And he kept saying, they're up there, they're up there. And at the time, I thought that maybe it was because, you know, there would be people, uh, the guards patrolling the walls, because these walls are like, what, 30 feet high, they're 8 feet thick. But what I learned this time, there is no walkway at the top of the these walls. The guards actually did, could not walk across the top there. There are the guard houses at the end. But there isn't a walkway. But this voice kept insisting they're up there. They're up there. And he kept asking for help. He kept saying he was in pain. Um, So I'm curious about that. I mean, I definitely want to go back to death row. I want to see if we can connect again. I mean, heck, if the old guy wants to call me names again, go for it. You know, I'm ready for it. I mean, it's... It's interesting to see the voice that came through, but it was almost like this poor guy, the younger guy, was just scared to death. And it's it, that's part of like, you know, we said that we wanted to ask different questions. And, you know, after after last week's show with, with, with the, the sex questions, I do want to know about that. I want to know about the... Because the solitary confinement did end, I believe it was like in the 40s, because the overcrowding. Um, the uh, prison became, you know, more and more overcrowded. So in order to alleviate that, they started putting prisoners two to a cell. So, you know, that all of the solitary and the, the silence, that did stop after a while. But that doesn't mean that the activity within the prison I mean, as in any prison, stopped. I mean, when you put people, you know, when you when you put people in prison like that, as it happens today, you're going to have, you know, prisoners assaulting each other. You have prisoners taking advantage of each other. I mean, you know, everyone looks for the new meat that comes in. So was this poor young guy one of the new ones that just happened to be accosted by one of the older ones? Those are the kinds of things I want to, I want to find out. I, I want to learn about that part. I mean, we know the history, we know where it came from, but I have a feeling that a lot of these spirits that are there, they may not be from the beginning. They may be from the later years of the prison. You want to find out if the men had sex, didn't you? I do. <laughs> I do. Well, you I know, watched I, too many seasons of Oz. Come on. I know. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I did find out that Eastern State Penitentiary did not uh, execute the prisoners that were there on mm-hmm. death row. Uh, mm-hmm. They were, they were, they were put on death row until the time <laughs> that they were to be executed, and they were taken off site to another facility, and they were executed there. So, you know, when you say, uh, and I remembered that distinctly, uh, uh, the ghost box session that we had. Uh, the last time we were there, and I remember the gentleman spirit saying, you know, that they're they're up there, they're up there. Um, that could be in a direct relation to him trying to communicate, saying that, you know, the other men that he was with in death row are up there, meaning up there in the other facility being executed. Um, it could be, uh, you know, a sort of communication in that manner and not so much that he was referring to guards watching them or stuff you know or something like that again i'm only guessing but it could be it could be that that he was you know alerting us that that they're taking you know his fellow men that were on death row to another facility to have them executed and that may just be warning us warning us people you know well another know. spot it, it's interesting i mean you know there's so many things that we don't know so uh, 
what I look at it is when we go in there, yes, we do the research and we learn what's on paper, but no one can tell you exactly what happened except the people that have been there. And if they're still there, they're the ones that I want to communicate with. I want to know what it was like. Why would you remain in the spot? Why is it that that you're still here? You know, is there something mm-hmm. that we can do? And uh, I do... I know people say that they can do it, that they can help the spirit move on. I don't feel that I'm qualified enough to do something like that, and I would never claim to be able to do something like that. But if we could, I honestly think that that would be a wonderful thing to do. Now, one other thing, you know, kind of like to to change the subject a little bit, there's one spot that we've never been to, and we've never been to the medical ward. Um, one of the things with this prison, I mean, when it was built, I mean, it was a show place. People came from Europe. People came to come see this place. They all wanted to see this big, giant, you know, new facility that actually had running water, that actually had toilets within the cells. And this was all brand new to the prison systems when it was first built. But even then, um, you know, the the uh, what do you call it? the way that they got rid of human waste and stuff like that, it wasn't exactly that great. I mean, you know, the heating, the hot water ran right across next to the sewer pipes. So one of the things that I read when the prison was actually functioning, that you could smell the human waste through the whole thing. Because of this disease, there was a lot of disease that ran through this prison. So the medical ward, um, obviously had a lot of people that were placed in it and that died. We've never gone into this section. I know that there's other groups that have been there, and some of the activities that they report in the medical section is pretty intense. So we're talking about, you know, like when you think about some place like another place we've never been, Waverly Hills. I mean, that's a complete hospital. I mean, there are some other hospitals that, you know, Linda Vista, all of the activity that's in there, whenever you get a hospital, there seems to be a lot of activity, you know, whether or not it is because of the people of what they've suffered before they died or maybe because they've passed on much faster and don't realize that they're dead. I'm very curious about the medical ward. Um, I've been watching the uh, uh, Most Haunted investigation at Eastern State, and I will say that, I'm curious, not because of the most haunted crew, okay? Um, They seem to scream a lot. (laughs) You know, everything, Mm -hmm. you know, makes them scream. But I'm very curious about this this medical ward, and I really would like to go in there and see what it feels like. Yeah, and I I can't remember why we weren't able to go in there the last time. Um, I'm not sure if they were doing any kind of construction work there, and that's the reason why. But um, I certainly do want to get in there this time. I want to, you know, ask if if we're able to go there and and investigate. Now, just to give everybody a little bit of a precursor to what to expect or what we're doing next week – Lucy and I will be at Eastern State Penitentiary, and uh, we have rented the facility from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Normally, when we go on investigations, we're there almost the entire night, Um, but we have about seven hours in the facility, and we are going to be broadcasting live. We're actually going to be doing uh, the broadcast an hour earlier so it's going to be 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, and 7 p.m. Pacific Time. And that's only be 6 p.m.? It'll be 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Sorry. So, um, and the reason why we're doing that is because we have only a limited amount of time there, and obviously we can't broadcast um for a long period, we can only do a two-hour show. So we're going to do it from um, from 9 to 11. And uh, like I said before, we're going to try and do this in one location. I, in, you know, the, the, the frustrating part of this whole thing is that I cannot test and there's no way to find out where in Eastern State Penitentiary I'm going to get the best Wi-Fi and, and the best um, satellite broadcast that I can 
uh, until I get there. And so we're going to try and first, as soon as we get there at 7 o'clock, obviously we've got a lot of setup to do. I've got my DVR system to do. Um, we've got to scope out the area and find out the best ways, places where we can put. We've got a ton of digital video, um, digital uh, audio recorders now. Um, I think between Lucy and I, I think we've got about 10 audio recorders. And mm-hmm. so we're going to uh, record and mark up where we're going to be putting these all around the uh, prison. And we like to do that because we want to leave the recorder there the entire night because if we're not in the location, we will still want to be, quote, unquote, investigating. So um, we've got a lot of setup to do beforehand, but um, I want to make sure that we're able to um, get any kind of signal or satellite in, in any of the, the areas. So as I say right now, I'm hoping to do cell block 12 because I feel as though that that is the most active um, it is uh, where there is mo- the more hardened criminals were kept when cell block 12 was built, and it was built at a later period. It wasn't there in 18, uh, 1829 when it was first built. So um, I believe that that's the area that I want to concentrate on because I know in the past, in the previous experiences that we've had, that's been the most effective. And so we want to make sure that we get the most effective on the show so that you experience it, you guys who are listening. <clears throat> so, um, but if we get there and for some reason we're not able to get any kind of, you know, satellite signals, we may be moving it to another facility uh, where we can. And um, I know one of the areas that I know has a lot of windows is death row. So if it's not cell block 12, I think we can possibly most certainly do uh, uh, death row. Um, mm-hmm. it, and so it's either going to be of those two, hopefully. Hopefully the weather is, is going to be good that day. Lucy, I know it's going to be cold. I just looked at the weather. <laughs> it is going to be in the 40s. Um, well, actually, that's during the day, and I think it's going to be in the high of 39 uh, at night, uh, you know, at sundown. So um, hopefully it's not too cold. Uh, hopefully the weather stays, there's no rain or there's no uh, snow, because, again, that hampers any of the signals that happen. And so uh, we're going to try our best to make sure that this happens. In, in, the last time, um, no, sorry, was there one time that we tried to do this and we couldn't, Lucy? I think we tried to do it. No, we've never tried to broadcast from there. No, we never tried to broadcast from there, but I'm not sure if we ever went to another location that we said we were going to do and we couldn't do it. I can't remember. No, if, we've uh, we've that, been able to do it. I mean, um, no, we've actually been able to do it each time we tried. It was well, kind of so, sketchy in some places. I know Prospect Place was kind of sketchy at first. We couldn't get the signal. We couldn't get Wi-Fi at first. Right. But We've we've been able to to do it. We've been able to broadcast. Right. So I mean, if if when and like I mentioned before, um, we're certainly going to try and get this on Justin TV, and so we get a live video feed of us. So um, Lucy, you're going to wear your purple coat. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wear, I will never wear leather again when I am <laughs> on investigation. I learned my lesson. <laughs> You got to dress up that day. You got to do your hair and your nails and your makeup because you're going to be on TV now. I'm going to go get my nails done tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, if we're not able to get video feed, I can guarantee you we most likely will be able to be broadcasted online on radio. So um, uh, we're going to try our hardest to, to get that done. And if you guys out there that are listening tonight, and you want to most definitely be on the air with us and do a live EVP session with us, feel free to email us at paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com and let us know that you'd like to participate in this. And what we'll do is we'll ask you for the phone number that you'll be calling from so that when you do call in to the show, we'll make sure that we put you through specifically. We want to give everybody the opportunity to be involved and participate in this 
because we we feel for you guys who who don't get the opportunity to do this. And so we want to make sure that we get you guys on the air and have your voice at Eastern State Penitentiary and have you ask the questions to the spirits. Have you participate in the EVP session that Lucy and I are going to do that night. And so if you really want to and you're afraid that if you call in you're not going to get picked up, send us an email at paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com or you can go on our Facebook page at Paranormal Review Radio and just message us on there. And uh, we'll get the information from you, we'll give you the information, and we'll make sure that we get you on the air. We want to give a, a lot, we can get, uh, I think we can get 50 callers on the line, I think it'll be chaotic, mm-hmm. but we mm-hmm. can get a lot of people on the phone line, and it would be really cool to cultivate all of that energy from all of you out there and help facilitate it. Now, there's going to be five people. It's Lucy, myself, and three other people that are going to be at Eastern State Penitentiary. But if we can get ten more people, uh, they don't physically have to be there, but if we can get ten people on the line with us and have you guys talk to the spirits out there and project your energy, do you know how much greater that is going to be in the communication? Do you know how awesome that is going to be to to ret- retrieve the communication and the voices from beyond because they're feeling that. They're feeding off of that energy. And that's what's going to help us broadcast, uh, uh, first of all, a better show, but that's what also is going to help us gather more of the information and the truth that you know we're all seeking. So uh, we implore you, please give us a call next week. Uh, or send us an email uh, this week. You can send us any day this week. We're going to be checking our emails and checking our Facebook, and uh, we will most certainly get back to you and let you know all that information. And um, yeah, I, I'm just really excited for this because for some reason I've got a feeling that something really good is going to happen. And you know Lucy and I have <laughs> talked about this all the time. And I know Lucy's laughing right now because she's feeling the same way. I, I know that something really awesome is going to happen, and I want you guys to experience it as well. Well, it's going to, you know, if we can get enough people on the line, I mean, it's kind of like a virtual seance, really, because we're going to right. be calling out the spirits. And the more energy that we are projecting, I mean, we've got five people there in the site, but adding everybody else to the mix, I mean, we're literally having a virtual seance. So this should be interesting. Lucy, aren't we also having somebody special call in, mm-hmm. or, or not? Did that is that confirmed? Oh no, that's confirmed. Okay, do you want to tell yes. everybody? Yes, um, you know we've we've done it in other places where we've had somebody come in, uh, somebody call who is uh, you know connected, you know who could be a medium. Well, Miss Robin Marie has graciously agreed to call in that night and try to connect with some of the spirits in Eastern State. So we are extremely excited about this. Robin has uh, said that she connects very well with the spirits in Eastern State. So we're looking forward to this. We want to see um, what comes of it, you know, what connections can we make. Um, And she actually could be like literally a guide that will help us to find the spots, to find the connections that are there, and hopefully get some really good interaction. So we're excited about this. This is going to be good. This is going to be awesome. I mean, I'm really looking forward to this one. I mean, we've been there twice already, and the third time, I think, is going to be even better. And I have to say, each time we've gone there, <clears throat> excuse me, it has become better and better. So... I can't wait to see what we're gonna what, what we're gonna find. One of the things that uh, you know, Lucy and I talk about all the time before we go on a location. If there's any kind of feelings that that pop up, even if there's any kind of synchronicity that happens before we go on an investigation, we always have our our eyes and ears open to to things that are, are talking or speaking to us before we go to a location. And I know, <clears throat> excuse me. For instance, I know with Velisca major things were going on between both Lucy and I mm-hmm. before we even went to to the location. And sure enough, we had um, an awesome time there. Communication, the EVPs that we captured, the evidence that we kept. We had doors opening and we got it on video. I mean, it was so amazing. It's almost as if they're, they, they know that we're coming. 
and and the the location was speaking out to us. And I told Lucy last week that um, I was walking to the store from my house. Uh, it was late afternoon, and I'm I'm. I tend to, and it's always been this way from, for me, even as a child, I usually tend to walk with my head down. Um, I always do that. And so I'm always looking at either the streets or, or the bottom half of trees or the sidewalk. I'm always doing that, and I'm always looking, and I find things all the time. I, you know, that's how I used to get money, Lucy. <laughs> I, I used to find so much money on the floor, my, my family hated me. But anyway... <laughs> I still do that to this day, and so uh, last week when I was walking to the avenue from my house, I'm walking on the sidewalk, you know, residential neighborhood, and I'm walking on the sidewalk, and what do I see on the floor, which is maybe about 100 feet away from my house, maybe a little bit further, um, what do I see on the floor? I find a flyer from Terror Behind the Walls, which is the haunted attraction at Eastern State Penitentiary. It was on the floor under a couple of, of leaves near a gate, near a fence. And, I, you know, I should have taken a picture at the moment because I know people are not believing me and they think I'm retarded or crazy or whatever. Um, and well, you are crazy. I know I am crazy. <laughs> but that's besides the point. But I saw this flyer from Terra Behind the Walls, and I'm saying to myself, <clears throat> I live in New York. Philadelphia is about two hours and 15 minutes away from me. What are the odds and the chances of having a flyer from Terra Behind the Walls be seen in my neighborhood about 100 feet away from my house and for me to see that uh, you know, two weeks prior to going to Eastern State Penitentiary for a paranormal investigation? To me, that's synchronicity. To me, those are the things that are calling out. And um, those are the things that usually tend to happen to, to me, and I know they happen to Lucy a lot too. Uh-huh. Um, and and it's always good to to understand it or to to receive the messages. We learn that a lot from from um, Trish and or the McGregors. I forgot his name. Trish and Rob Rob McGregor. Um, they are are big proponents of synchronicity, and they're they're great authors and. Uh, Rob has written um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, one of the Raiders of the Lost Ark um, uh, novels. And so yeah. um, uh, they they taught us about synchronicity and got us into and interested in the idea of synchronicity, how things are just meant to be, that there are there's messages and information that's given to us all the time. It's just we're not open to receiving it. And so after that, I remember after that episode, an interview that we did with them, I've opened myself a lot more to things. And so seeing this flyer from Terror Behind the Walls from Eastern State Penitentiary is just opening myself up to the idea that it, something is going to happen next week. Well, there's they know communication. We're I know. And, and there's communication that is needed and wanted and, and is is hoping to be received. And so that's why I think that just next week I think it's just going to be an awesome show. I'm not trying to hype it up or anything. It's just I have this feeling about it that I think it's almost as if. Like, my brain is telling me, okay, this is the time. This is the time. <laughs> why don't you tell, Lucy, why don't you tell everybody what, um, oh, gosh, the numerologist, what is her name? Oh, Cheryl Patton. Yes. Why don't you tell everybody what Cheryl Patton said to you? Okay. Well, Cheryl Patton, she had posted, one, oh, it was one time last week. And she was, you know, she says, oh, I got some time. Let's, let's, um, let's uh, you know, give me a date and we'll see what the the vibrations for that day is. And so I messaged her and I said, okay, what about um, November 22nd? And I'm trying to see exactly what she said. Um, And that's that's the date that we're going on uh, the investigation at Eastern State. Yes, that's the date that we're there. And the vibrations for that day is um, communication. It is fun. It is uh relaxation i'm trying so hard to try to get no i i remember she said that the communication is going to be running wild that day that mm-hmm. that it's going to be overflowing of communication but then she said as soon as the clock strikes midnight and it goes into the 23rd of november that's when everything stops everything ceases 
So I think all of the communication that we're going to get is going to happen before midnight. And that's why I wanted to try and see if we can get, uh, if, we, if, if anything, that we would start the show a little bit earlier, an hour earlier, and hopefully capture all of that communication on air. Well, specifically what she said about the 23rd, she said it's almost like kind of like this is my area, this is my home. And it's almost like the feeling that I got when I read it is like, they'll be open, they'll talk to us on the Friday night, but as soon as it turns to midnight, I think they're going to want us to go. So which right. means if we're still there, we probably will have activity, but the activity may change. Uh, when the 23rd, when the clock strikes midnight, all of a sudden the welcoming people may decide, you know, it's time for all of you guys to go. Right. That's what I'm getting from that. But it was pretty interesting the way that she put it. She says, you know, the the first part of the night is going to be communication. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. So I can't wait. Um, <laughs> but I also am looking forward to, of course, you know, we have to do things th- that are a little controversial. Um, do you want to mention what else we're going to do there? Or do you want to we're just... Gonna... <laughs> we're going we're, we're, we're to do the Ouija board. <laughs> I mean, and, I, and I, you know, I, I hope we do have live video feed that night because mm-hmm. I I bought the newest version of the Ouija board. Uh, this is the first of all the box. I love the box that it comes in because it almost looks like it is just an old um, beat up trunk, and that's what the box looks. I mean, it's cardboard, but um, the the actual board itself is awesome looking. It's so much better than the 1990s version that they had. And uh, the actual uh, planchette is a lighted planchette. I have to put batteries in this thing. How awesome is that? How awesome Mm -hmm. is this going to be? So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to this. And, of course, like I said, you know, we always get the people that say, oh, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be using that. But, again, in our experience in I, I can't speak for Anthony, but to me, it's just a tool. It's it's a tool no different than using a video recorder. It's no different than using uh, a digital recorder. It is simply a tool. And I really feel that the Ouija has gotten such a bad rap from media and movies and, and everything like that. Um, honestly, I, I'm not afraid to use it. I, I'm really not. But I know there are people out there that, are afraid to use it. And, you know, the minute you mention Ouija, then all of a sudden it's like, ooh, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Well, I have not found the evidence that shows me that it is any different than using a digital recorder or a spirit box. It's a communication tool. An ovulus is a communication tool. Your digital audio recorder is a communication tool. The ghost box, the Frank's box, that is a communication tool. All of it is the same. There's no difference to to then that of a car, piece of cardboard and plastic. There's no difference. It's just the technology is different. That's all it is. And the same connotation that everybody gives a Ouija board could be given to your audio recorder, and to your ghost box, and to your ovulus, to all of that inf- all of that uh, uh, equipment. And so, uh, you know, I understand that there's the stigmata on the Ouija board, and that people are frightened of it. But I think it is. It is because of the media and because of the history that that has been implanted on the word Ouija and 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 in in the the actual concept of working with it is so demonic. People call it demonic and satanic, and you know you're you're just opening yourself up. Well, you're opening yourself up, even if you don't even use a piece of tool, you're opening yourself up to possession or anything like that. When you walk into a haunted location, when you mm-hmm. speak, when you first speak and ask for communication. From a from a spirit, you're opening yourself up. You you are are, are are opening your 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 mind and your body to the idea that spirits can talk to you. But not o- not only that, but they can actually enter you, enter your body. And so, it, this 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 stigmata that everybody puts on on the Ouija board, um, you know, and I don't like it. And if you disagree with me, that is perfectly fine. You you do have that right to disagree with me. It's your feelings. I can't change people who don't have, uh, 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 the, you know, the, the same feelings that I do. And so that's fine. But just think about it. 
really think about it. It's no different than you just speaking it or you just you bringing in a piece of equipment that uh, is facilitating that communication just the same way. It's just the way that you're doing it on the Ouija board is more manual. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. And, and again, too, I want to remind everybody, too, it's like, you know, when you're going into a haunted location, of course, protection is is key, okay? You should never, ever, ever go on a paranormal investigation unless you think about protection. And whether, you know, whatever works for you, whether it's, you know, prayer, whether it's connecting with your higher power, whether it's holy water, whether it's praying, you have to have your protection. You have to have it. So you open yourself up the minute you walk into a haunted location. But you never, ever, ever, and this is why I have a problem with a lot of these excursions that people put on and let peop- you know, bring people into haunted locations. There is so much potential for something to happen because not everybody understands what you need to do before you go to a location. So to bring in someone that doesn't know anything about what's going on, that doesn't understand the importance of protection, yes, to me that is more dangerous than actually me and Anthony using a Ouija board. Mm-hmm. I, I think we can go on for another two hours about the Ouija board, Lucy. I don't want to <laughs> get into that tangent. We have uh, about four and a half minutes left. Why don't you get into who the fan of the week is? Okay. This week... Uh, our Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week is... Um, I, we actually found our Paranormal uh, Review Radio Fan of the Week from YouTube. And she's on Facebook. But um, it goes back to our show on exorcism. And she posted a really, really good... She was a very, she posted a very favorable co- uh, comment on the show. I mean, she actually got what we were trying, she understood what we were trying to do. And this week our fan of the week is Angela Malloy of Mesa, Arizona. Um, She likes Angry Birds. She likes Yorkshire Terriers. She is a fan of American Horror Story, Destination Truth, Ghost Adventures, and of course she likes Paranormal Review Radio. So we wanted to say thank you, Angela, for listening to us. Thank you for being a fan. And thank you for understanding what we were trying to do when we did that show. I mean, that was it was a pleasant surprise, you know, in, in the middle of all, you know, the hubbub and all of the things that happened leading up to the show. It was a pleasure hearing from someone who understood what we were trying to do. So yeah, congratulations thank- and thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much. And um, don't forget, if you want to be a Paranormal Review Radio fan of the week, just like us on Facebook, Paranormal Review Radio. Okay. Well, you know what? Eastern State Penitentiary, it started out as an experiment to reform people. But you know what? It turned into something very, very wrong. The fear and the pain that occurred in this massive location, it still seeps from the walls and the very ground that it sits on. While the city of Philadelphia grew around this place, the men and women who perished there remain inside this fortress of sorrow, and their voices and their presence can still be felt today. We want to thank everybody for listening to us, and we cannot wait for next week. So, you know, we're going to head back next week. It's Friday night, November 22nd. Again, like Anthony said, we're going to be attempting to broadcast live from inside the prison. It is our third time there in this spot, and each time has been simply amazing. This location has never disappointed us. What are we going to find this time? Well, join us next week live from Eastern State and find out. We want to thank everyone for listening and supporting us. You know, we really do love every single one of you. Thank you, Anthony, for watching over me every time we investigate. I really know I'm safe with you. So until next week, dear peeps, keep researching and have a paranormal week. Good night. Good night, everybody.
Radio. 